Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series I've entitled Christian Philosophy. This coming Friday, tomorrow, is going to be our last day to deal with this. And you know, in a way, I kind of hesitate to do that because I there is so much more I'd like to say, but it, I've been teaching on Christian Philosophy 1 and Christian Philosophy 2 for about two months now, and there's other things I want to teach on, and so I'm going to move on, and tomorrow's going to be our last day to offer these materials. I've been talking about the last few days about we need to have a philosophy that we are in this world but not of this world. There needs to be a natural Christian skepticism towards all of the leaders of this world system and their views that are based on quote unquote science. I tell you, today science has really neat, reached a uh, religious status, a God status, to where people have exalted it and they are embracing things in the name of science and think that it is actual and factual. And yet, there are a lot of scientists who disagree with other scientists over all of these things. You know, science is supposed to not have a predisposition. They're just supposed to examine the facts. And yet, there's a lot of things that it's not factual at all. I tell you, there's just so much that I'd love to say here. Let me go back to this verse. I want to finish reading these verses before I make some points. I was yesterday in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. It says, This I say, therefore... And testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles. In our context, this would be don't walk like those who don't know Jesus, that aren't born again. And they walk in the vanity of their mind. The word vanity means the inutility and transientness. Inutility just means they aren't utilizing the brain that God has given them. And transient means that they aren't focused. They are just, you know, a transient is what you'd say about a person that just never has a certain dwelling place. They're just living here or there or whatever. They're in transit. They don't have a fixed position. And this is the way that the world is. You know, when I was a kid in the 70s, well, I guess I graduated high school in 67, so I guess I was already not a kid. I was uh, in my 20s. But anyway, back in the 60s and 70s, the thing was global cooling. We were entering into another ice age. And if you look at the stats, did you know that in 1940 there had been a, a pretty prolonged increase from back in the 1800s to the 1940s? And then from the 1940s until the 60s and 70s, there was a cooling. And from this, they were projecting that we were entering another ice age. Now, some of you who are younger than this may think that, man, that is just weird because now they're calling global warming. But see, this is the transientness. This is the fact that people, there you give it a little while and it'll change. I remember when I was a kid, again, that probably means I was 30 or 40. Who knows when this was? But I remember when I was a lot younger that they came out with saccharin. This artificial sweetener was the source of all cancer and causing all kinds of things. And so they banned it. And a lot of people who were on like um, these uh, insulin, they were having a problem with their insulin and they couldn't have just straight sugar or something like that. They were nearly dependent upon saccharin. And it threw a lot of people into a state of chaos. And there was panic over this. And so they banned saccharin. They came up with all these other things. Well, it was only in the last, I, you know, I don't remember the details, but five years or so, that they came out and now they're saying, well, that saccharin, the reason it was causing cancer in lab rats was because they injected them with the equivalent of 180 uh, saccharin sodas in one day. And at that level, it was causing cancer. And so they came back and redid it and said, you know what, in minor doses like people use it, it was no damage at all. And yet it, it caused a lot of conflict. I remember people that were insulin dependent and stuff that that 
really mess them up. And yet, see here again is another list of the transientness. You, I remember when they came out that fat was bad. All fat was bad. And boy, they went to non-fat this and non-fat that. And I mean, the whole world was on this non-fat binge. And then they came out and realized that you have to have some fat. And if you don't, your brain doesn't function normally. And that confirmed all of my suspicion that those people, amen, their brain wasn't fun functioning normally. <laughs> but my point is that this is the way the world is. They tell you, you can't do this and cut out all of this stuff. And then they'll come back and say, you know what? In moderation, this is actually good for you. You need some of this. We were all against cholesterol and then realized that there's a good cholesterol. And they're all against this. And if you wait, they'll come back and change. You know, all of these health things, they fluctuate and they go back and forth. If it was factual, if there was just a, a cardinal law that this is the way it is, then it wouldn't change from generation to generation. But those of you that are younger than I, if you were to go back and study some of these things, you'd find out that there was a global cooling and we were in an ice age coming up. Now it's global warming. And, you know, I was just on the Internet last night looking at some things, and I wrote a couple of these things down. There's this uh, guy, Bob Carter, who's a professor of research at the Marine Geophysical Laboratory at James Cook University in Australia. And he came out, and from scientific basis, and he's not the only one, there's others, has totally disproved and called this global warming thing a scam. And he put up the actual charts uh, that go back thousands of years and show that over thousands of years, you know, from what they do with the ice packs and they go in and they look and analyze these data, they go back, I don't know, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, which I'm, I don't even agree with that, that the Earth's been around that long. But from their standpoint, there has been a warming trend. But for the last 10,000 years, statistically, it has been basically static. Now, there's constantly ups and downs, and he was making this point that there are solar flares, and there's different things that cause warming trends. And then he went down to the 20th century and showed you the entire mapping of the 20th century temperatures, and in 1940, there was a peaking, just like I mentioned earlier. In 1995, there was a peaking in the warming trend. But every time, and he went back for 10,000 years and showed you this and analyzed Every time there is this peaking uh, that is caused by different things, like in 1995, he was saying that there was, a sol there was an increased solar activity, which didn't have anything to do with our carbon emissions, you, uh, you know, I just don't understand how they can sit there and say that it's our CO2 emissions that cause the sun to flare and have all of these uh, flares and stuff that affected the Earth's uh, warming. But anyway, there was a warming trend, and this is what Al Gore and those who have been blowing the warning about global warming looked at in the early 90s, and there was a rise in 1995. There has been a retreat of some of the ice pack, but it's happened before. And, and anyway, his point was that every time something like this happens in the 1940s, then there was nearly a three-decade decrease. And he began to explain what he called the iris effect, that when you have increased temperatures, that means that there's increased evaporation, that leads to more clouds, and that leads to these high cirrus clouds with the ice thing. And what this does, um, I, I'm certainly not qualified to explain this, but all of these clouds kind of insulate the uh, Earth and keep the sun's solar flares from reaching the Earth. Uh, anybody that has paid attention will recognize this on a cloudy day. It's not as warm as it is on a totally sunny day. And not only does it keep the temperatures on the earth down, but it actually reflects some of that heat back out into space. And his point is that God created, he didn't say this, this is my interpretation, but God created the earth so it regulates itself. If you do have a rising of the temperatures and that causes the clouds to increase, it it keeps the sun from warming as much. It reflects heat back. And he showed statistically over the last 10,000 years that every time there has been a peak, and the peak has gone up as much as 4 degrees recently in the uh, 
1900s, whereas this peak that was reached in 1995 was about 1.5 degrees. It was a relatively small warming trend, but all of the people saw this warming trend and had been blowing the, the horn and, and crying out global warming and it's going to destroy the earth. So it was a relatively mild warming trend, but every time that has happened, that has caused the cloud cover to increase, and it is followed by a decrease. And sure enough, in 1998, there was a noticeable decrease that began, and for the last 10 years, there has actually been a decrease in temperature. In uh, July 2009, there were 3,000 low Re uh, record temperatures recorded in the northeast of the United States. I just read an article in U.S. Today this last week that the northeast has been the coolest that it has been in over a hundred years of recorded temperatures. Now the southwest part of the United States has set record highs. And so it depends, again, on how you interpret things you could sit there, and if all you want to focus on is the southwest, you could sit there and cry global warming and all of this. But the point I'm making is, and the point that this Bob Carter was making is, that temperatures go in cycles, and the earth regulates itself. It compensates for this. And actually, this Bob Carter was making the point that we are headed towards a cool, cool down of things. And global cooling is much more damaging than global warming. Actually, the warming uh, facilitates a number of things. Most people like to go to warm climates and things like this, but if things were to uh, cool off, uh, that would be much more damaging. You know, the man who is the head of the uh, Weather Channel uh, has come out and called this nothing but a scam. And people have discredited him and, and say things like, well, he, he is a broadcaster. All he does is run a weather channel. He doesn't have any degrees in all of this. But there are people with degrees, such as this Bob Carter, who has called it an absolute scam. Let me say this. Uh, what credentials does Al Gore have? Man, to put out an inconvenient truth and, and be trumpeting all of these things about global warming. He certainly isn't qualified to do this. But anyway, they, there is just so much in here. Uh, let me read just a couple of these statements here. Uh, talking about the global ice packs melting and the water in the oceans rising 20 degrees and the lands being flooded and hundreds of millions of refugees from from world flooding because of global warming. Uh, this man said, well, it simply is not happening. Worldwide, there was a significant natural warming trend in the 80s and 90s as a solar cycle peaked with lots of sunspots and solar flares. That ended in 1998, and now the sun has gone quiet with fewer and fewer sunspots, and the global temperatures have gone into decline. Earth has cooled for almost 10 straight years. So I ask Al Gore, where's the global warming? And on and on and on we could go with all of this. It is just simply, I believe we need to have a philosophy that rather than think that the earth is fragile, rather than think that man has reached this status to where now we can destroy the earth when the scripture makes it very clear how the earth is going to be destroyed. It's not going to be destroyed until God says it's destroyed. He's going to come back and it's going to be with an intense flame and heat and it's not going to happen through global warming. It's going to be the judgment of God. But see, this, I believe, really speaks to the arrogance of man, how they think that they can change things. You know, I've heard this also, and I assume that this is true. I've heard it from independent, multiple sources. You can find it on the Internet, which doesn't mean it's true. But I've heard that this CO2, the carbon uh, footprint thing that, you know, they're making you pay money and do all of this, that 25% of all carbon emissions in the world come from animals cows. They're manure. It gives off methane gas, which produces CO2. 25% of all of the Earth's CO2 come from animals, whereas 1% of all CO2 emissions on the Earth 
come from man and our industrialized stuff. If we were to cut everything out and go back to horse and buggy days, all you could do is decrease the CO2 emissions by 1%, and probably it'd be less than that because if we increased the horses, we'd have more methane gas and more CO2 emissions. If you were to kill all of the cows, you'd probably get rid of 20% of all of the CO2 emissions. Here's my point, that people are just saying things, and I don't think that it is a coincidence that Al Gore led the charge, did all of this, and then started a company that he is making billions with a B off of for people to give a carbon donation to offset their carbon footprint. Did you know that literally this whole global warming thing has the potential of wrecking the world economy? It really does. This is not an insignificant thing. And I tell you, I just believe that if you had a Christian philosophy and if you took things with a grain of salt, if you believed what the Word had to say over just somebody because they have a DD or a PhD behind their name, that doesn't mean that what they're saying is right. You know, I have... Uh, Boy, here's another thing. I might as well just get this out, too. But the way that everybody's embraced um, evolution, you know what? It, it doesn't square with the Word of God. Now, there are some people that interpret the first chapter of Genesis and say that these six days weren't six literal days. They could have been eons. They could have been six eons of time. I personally don't accept that, but you know I'm not even going to argue that point. If, even if you believe that the earth is millions and billions of years old, you cannot get around the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1 that the Lord created animals, fish. He created uh, the animals that are on the earth, the animals that fly, and then he created man. And he told each one of those groups to bring forth fruit after their kind. It is an established point in Scripture that only birds produce birds. Fish don't produce birds. Birds don't produce mammals. They are separate kind, and the Scripture makes it very clear that we all reproduce after our kind. And even if you were to embrace the eons and millions and billions of years that are necessary for evolution, you cannot, under any stretch of the imagination, make the Word of God say that one species develops and evolves into another species. And evolution is, is dependent upon that. It has never been observed. You'll hear some people talk about it, but when you, when you try and pin them down and say, well, show me the, the step in between monkeys and men. It has never been observed. They will try and say that they think this is happening, but it has never been confirmed. There is nothing in reality today that shows an evolution. They will sometimes point to one kind of moth and say that this is an evolution from this type of moth into another type of moth. Or they'll talk about the way that you can breed horses and you take an Arabian horse and if after years of breeding you can change and come up with this type of horse. But you know what? Every one of those, they're still moths. They're still horses. There has never been, there will never be, there is no proof of any species ever becoming another species. It goes contrary to the Word. And so I reject it based on the Word. Some people think, well, you're the only one. No, I, back in the uh, 1990s, my information on this is old. But Dr. Carl Ball has a creation research institution in Glen Rose, Texas. I've uh, seen many of his videos. I've seen him on many television things. He's got all the PhDs and all of the degrees for those that have to have a degree before anybody's opinion counts. And there are, at that time, back in the 1990s, were over 3,900 scientists that rejected evolution on the basis of scientists. Many of them were non-Christian. There was one particular who was a Jew who had come around to uh, adopt this place, that there had to be some creator to do this. And there were over 3,900 at that time, and that's just when this thing was getting going. I'm sure that there are thousands of um, scientists 
who reject evolution just on the basis of science. Like, for instance, and again, my knowledge in this is very limited. I don't have to have an, a lot of extra biblical material because I believe the Bible. But I have uh, studied math. I was a math major. I've always been interested in this. And there is uh, empirical data that the uh, gravitational pull of the Earth is decreasing over a period of time. It's minute, but it is a measurable and it's a consistent decline in gravity. And if the Earth was to be billions of years old, actually if it was to be much over 10,000 or 15, 20,000 years old based on mathematical formulas, did you know that if you go back, if the gravity is decreasing at a, at a consistent rate and it's measurable, then for you to backtrack into history and go back, life as we know it could not be sustained on this planet above 15, 20,000 years ago. They also say that you can't have the humans and these dinosaurs that lived millions and millions and millions of years before that. And yet I have been to a fossil bed in Glen Rose, Texas and seen a dinosaur track with a human footprint inside the dinosaur track. You can see them both right there together. I've seen that with my own eyes and people discount that. For evolution to exist, you have to embrace things that defy logic. I've, I've also was uh, into math and I studied the laws of probability and did you know that anything to the 10th power is mathematically, statistically impossible? And yet, for evolution to have taken place, there are so many variables that had to all happen at one time that it is approximately 10 to the something, I forget the exact number now, but it's trillions of power. Anything to the 10th power is statistically, mathematically impossible, and yet evolution is dependent upon something that is wildly impossible. You know, I've heard the story that if you were to go to uh, the Boeing plant where they have all of the parts for a plane and if you dropped a nuclear bomb there and had this explosion and the results of that explosion was that there was a 747 plane assembled and perfectly put together and, and trimmed out and everything is perfect, the chances of a bomb causing those parts to come together are infinitely better than the chance of evolution the chances of an explosion going off in a printing press and having a Bible completely printed and, and stacked and collated and bound and having multiple Bibles printed is like one billionth the chance of evolution taking place. And yet people believe that. I'm telling you, there needs to be a Christian philosophy. We need to recognize that God's Word is true. And people, I don't care how many degrees they have behind their name, if it doesn't square with what the Bible says, I believe it's wrong. I'm probably going to lose a lot of viewers, probably going to get a lot of people mad, but you know what? I still hold to the Word of God as being accurate. God's the one that created everything. He is not behind the times. We are in our own sophistication getting away from just things that are simple and obvious to anybody that has a heart to hear. You know, I'm out of time today. I will conclude this series on our program tomorrow. I encourage you to listen to our announcer and call or write and receive these materials. Andrew's complete teaching series titled Christian Philosophy Part 2 is available on either CD or on DVD for 13 pounds. The DVDs are made from Andrew's daily television program. Request CD album T1062C or DVD album T1062D when you contact us. The supplemental material Andrew mentioned will also be included with each album. The fourth teaching in the CD album titled In But Not Of The World is also available for three pounds. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fourth CD free of charge. Request teaching TCP10C when you write or call, and we'll be pleased to send it to you. We'd like to remind you that Andrew's latest book titled The Believer's Authority is also available for seven pounds. Contact us today to get your copy. 
visit our website where you can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. On our website, you'll not only find materials from today's broadcast, you'll find a wealth of resources free for you to download for yourself and share with others. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Our address is AWME, that's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. I'd like to encourage you to visit our website. We have that address right there on the screen. And you know, we have all of our programs there that you can watch them in advance. I have over 2,000 television programs that you can watch, thousands of radio programs. I've got hundreds of my teachings available, Bible commentary. It's just a tremendous resource. Plus, I have our uh, guest book. And you know, I'm going to be getting a lot of criticism. People are going to really respond to this teaching. I pray that those of you who are enjoying it will also respond and help balance out some of these things. And if you sign that guest book, I try and read that every day or I read it as often as I can. And it would be a real blessing to us. But it would be a blessing to you. Check out our website. The address is right there on your screen. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Budapest, Hungary for a Gospel Truth Seminar October 17th and in Buxton, Derbyshire in England for the Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe Ministers Conference October 19th through the 21st. He'll also be in Karlsruhe, Germany October 23rd through the 25th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. I'm coming to Budapest, Hungary on October the 17th for one day's worth of meetings. I can't pronounce the name of the place that we're using, but hopefully they've got it on the screen. And I tell you, we're going to have a great time ministering the Word of God. I've been to Hungary once before and had tremendous results. People there are hungry for the Word. And so we're going to be there sharing the Word October the 17th in Budapest, Hungary. I encourage you to come and join me for a great time in the Word. Join us tomorrow for Gospel Truth as Andrew continues his teaching titled Christian Philosophy.